Good morning. Welcome to Trinity. How about you take your hymnal? I mean, your. You take your hymnal out. There's nothing wrong with taking your hymnal out right now. We're not going to use it. Take out your bulletin. We'll look at a few announcements. If you're a guest, I want to welcome you. And if you'll look in a pew rack in front of you, you'll find a registration for a card, a little information card. If you'll fill that out, place it in the, the offering plate later on in the service, we'll appreciate that. And give us a little information about yourself. We would uh, give you some information about the church, and we'll just share some information and get to know one another a little bit. Now let's go over a few announcements and see what's going on in the next few days. Today our young adults are going out to eat at Jason's Deli. If y'all would meet over here in front of the organ, beside the organ, and gather up and then you make plans and y'all are going out to eat at Jason's Deli right after this service. Please see the reminder about the Valentine's Banquet tonight. It starts at 5 p.m. down in the Fellowship Hall. Tonight there's no children's choirs. Please also see the announcement about the special call church conference called by our Farmer's Market Committee. It'll be on February 22nd at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. The Farmer's Market Committee is proposing that the church renew our contract with the Madison Farmer's Market in 2017. The 2016 contribution statements are out. Yay, I thought y'all would cheer on that one. We've they are in the gathering area, right across from the fireplace right out here. The Trinity t-shirts and sweatshirts that y'all have ordered will be in the gathering area on Wednesday night. They'll be set out there on tables with your names on them. Uh, Trinity University, our adult education classes, they will resume next Sunday night at 6 p.m. At this time, I invite you to stand, greet one another, and pass the peace of Christ. Today's worship, we focus on John the Baptist asking one of our ultimate questions in life. He asked Jesus, are you the one? Welcome to Trinity. Please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here today, to come and worship you. Lord, I pray that you will be with us as we hear your word, we sing your praises. Lord, I pray that you will bless us, and I pray, Lord, that, that our worship will be acceptable to you today. Thank you so much for loving us. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let us now sing together our hymn of praise, hymn number 216, O oh, four, a thousand tongues to sing. Please stand as we sing together.
God calls us to be still and know that he is God, but that takes time, and we're all very busy with other things. We like to stop each week during our service to remember to slow down and be still and listen for God to speak to us and remind us of what is true and important. Please join me now in taking a few moments to pray silently. Lord, we come to you and ask that you bless us today and bless our week ahead. Do not allow its challenges to overwhelm us and let us always remember that you are with us. Thank you, Lord, for the time that you give us to be together today and honor you. In your holy name we pray, amen. Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike no cares could destroy, be there at our waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts, Lord, at the break of the day. Lord of all eagerness, Lord of all faith, whose strong hands were skilled at the plain and the lathe, be there at our labors and give us, we pray, your strength in our hearts, Lord, at the noon of the day. kindliness, Lord of all grace, your hands swift to welcome, your arms to embrace, be there at our homing, and give us, we pray, your love in our hearts, Lord, at the eve of the day. Lord of all gentleness, Lord of all calm, whose voice 
This is contentment whose presence is balm. Be there at our sleeping and give us, we pray, your peace in our hearts, Lord, at the end of the Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 23. The disciples of God of John the Baptist soon heard of all Jesus was doing. When they told John about it, he sent two of the disciples to Jesus to ask him, Are you really the Messiah, or shall we keep on looking for him? The two disciples found Jesus while he was curing many sick people of their various diseases, healing the lame and the blind and casting out evil spirits. When they asked him John's question, this was his reply. Go back to John and tell him all you have seen and heard here today. How those who are blind can see. The lame are walking without a limp. The lepers are completely healed. The deaf can hear again. The dead came back to life and the poor are healing, hearing the good news. And tell him, blessed is the one who does not lose his faith in me. Bless the reading of God's word. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of testimony, hymn number 572, I Love to Tell the Story. Please stand as we sing together.
Please be seated. Trinity supports CBF Global Missionaries Keith Holmes and Mary Van Renan in Europe. They bear witness to Jesus Christ by providing resources to Romani believers who are eager to learn more. This is one of their stories. November made the seventh time that Dutch Baptists have flown to Romania to teach the Gypsy Smith School in Bucharest. The school meets four times a year for one week intensive training. We resource coordinators do not have the fun of teaching these enthusiastic Romani believers ourselves, but it gives us great satisfaction to link people who have those teaching skills with leaders eager to learn. To see Christians cooperating across national, ethnic, and linguistic lines to advance the kingdom. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer. Amen.
believe they just took us to church today, y'all. <laughs> what a great job, Taylor, our minister of music and the choir. Thank you so much. It's good to see you all here today. Thank you for being in church and choosing to worship our Lord with us here at Trinity. I want to share, it's joy in the house. That's a good theme, so I want to share some good news with you. I'll send an e-group message to you this week, probably tomorrow. Uh, just so you know the impact when you give, uh, the impact that it's having around the world. I got a letter this week from Susie Painter, who is our executive coordinator for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, one of our primary missions partners. And it was just thanking us for our gifts and the impact that it's had last year. And uh, so I sent them back and I said, I'd like an e-copy so I could, you know, send it out to you all. And, uh, and I said, by the way, where do we sort of stand in, in the giving uh, related to the 1,800 churches in CBF Life? And this is the response I got. Your church is number 29. It's pretty good, isn't it? I have 1,800. Number 29, top giving church for all funds including support for field personnel. You're number 13 in the offering for global missions, and that's the money that goes 100% to keep our missionaries on the field. And I think that's wonderful. And number 60 then in general giving. So number 29, 13 in offering for global missions and general giving, which does theological education and supporting young Baptists and a lot of other things, number 60. So uh, the last little part of that, she said, well, this is fascinating. And I thought it was too. And I tell you that to tell you how important your giving is. Uh, when you're a top giver to anything, the, the folks who depend on that, that and your gifts, uh, they really know how much the impact is and how much it matters. So you are really directly influencing the number of people who can serve the, as missionaries around the world and thus sharing the gospel. So thank you for doing that. I also tell you to say thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud of you, and thank you for your sacrificial giving through our church to the ministries, not only here in Madison, but around the world. Now to the sermon. The boys, uh, my two of my sons were up this weekend from Alabama, and somehow we got to talking about how you view things in life and what you see and what you miss. And I had remembered an old video some of you might have seen, and it's a video of, of, of a, I think you can look it un, up under monkey business something. Anyway, and it had a, uh, these three, six basketball players. There's three of them in black and three in white, and they're passing a basketball. Have y'all seen this video before? And you're supposed to count the number of passes that the white team is making. And while you're doing it, I'll give this part away, a gorilla walks through the scene. And then after it's over with, they, they say, well, how many passes? And you know, people will name that. And then said, how many of you saw a gorilla? And over and over again, about 50% of the people see the gorilla. Half see it and half don't. Now, I'm telling you that because you can expect, if you go look it up, you'll expect to see the gorilla. You'll probably see it. But there's some other stuff there, too, that you might miss. So you might want to try it. That made me think about it because in developing the sermon this week, I was thinking about in the Old Testament, the ancient Judaism had a, had a sort of rule. When you went to court, if anything was going to stand up in court, it had to have two witnesses, two male witnesses. And they did this because they felt, felt like it would confirm if one person saw something, another one see it, it would confirm that it actually occurred. And that two people could see, you know, they see different parts of a picture of something that happens. So they could get a complete, a more complete understanding of what had occurred. It's interesting in the Gospel of Luke, we've been through Luke for quite a few Sundays here. Luke does this as well from the very beginning. There's a lot of two witnesses. But this is how Luke does it. When Jesus is a baby and is presented by his parents at the temple for dedication, it is a man and a woman, Simeon and Anna, who are witnesses that this is the child who is the Son of God. Later on, there will be a couple of miraculous stories of Jesus healing one a daughter, one a son, and it is a Roman centurion and a widow who both are witnesses to the power of Jesus. And at the empty tomb, for example, there are two messengers of God called angels who will be there who will tell us that He is not in the tomb, for He is alive. It's a really neat uh, way of thinking about it. And we all know we have not one gospel to tell us the story of Jesus, but we have four, and I'm very grateful for that. And one of the things that is a value for us of having four Gospels is each of these witnesses sharing the story of Jesus have their own unique take on it, if you will. What they saw, what they heard, the information they got from the first witnesses as they write down their accounts of Jesus Christ. And they each look at it from a different sort of point of view. 
For, so, for example, John the Baptist that we heard a little bit about this morning. In Matthew's Gospel, John is presented to us as the one who is going to foreshadow the life of Jesus to come. His life sort of mirrors what's going to happen to Jesus. And in Mark, Mark sort of puts it as John is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So it's very important that he comes as the voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. And in John's Gospel, John presents John the Baptist as a great testifier. He at one point will say to his own followers, he had disciples himself, he will wean them off himself and send them to Jesus. And he'll point to Jesus and he'll say, now that's the one you really need to be following because he's greater than I am. So we have this. It's really interesting. So then we come to this story when John has been arrested by Herod and he's languishing in the dungeon of one of Herod's palaces. Herod throws very perverse parties at this place, but down in the dungeon he keeps some of his political prisoners. One is John the Baptist. And in that story, we've often heard it really from the point of view, I think, of the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John. And it goes sort of like this that he is arrested and he is languishing in prison and he sends two of his disciples, two witnesses, to go to Jesus and ask him this question, are you the one or should we wait for someone else? And the, the way this is often presented to us is that John is in despair. He is despondent. He is in a situation where he has preached Jesus out there in the wilderness by the Jordan River and he's pointed to him as the greater one. He's the Messiah. But the signs are not working out the way he thought they would be. Nothing great has happened yet in Jesus' ministry. And he's languishing. His life is hanging by a thread, controlled by an evil tyrant, if you will. And so he is worried and he's doubting and he's struggling and he's hurt. And he asks this question, are you the one or should we be looking for someone else? And it is remarkable, really. Because this is John the Baptist. He was here recently, as you know, when we talked about him, and I had my old camel hair sport coat on because he wore this camel hair outfit and he ate locust and honey. And I've always thought about him as being a very Old Testament style prophet, very confident, thus saith the Lord. So it's interesting to see him reduced in this despair to ask this question out of sadness and why. Because one of the reasons is the context of him. It's important for us to know it. He's in prison. Maybe you've been in a place that you might call a prison too. Maybe you're in it now. He didn't bring it on himself. Somebody else put him there. And he doesn't like it. It's not where he wants to be. He is a very free, independent person. But he is confined in this dungeon. And he's put there out of uh, the whim of a tyrant who is really a bad, bad guy. And in his despair, he reaches out to Jesus. And he's reaching out to Jesus, which is a great model for us when we're in those places, because he needs some reassurance. He's looking for hope. And so he sends two of his best friends and most trusted disciples to ask him about it. John Claypool was one of the my heroes of preaching years ago was preaching and talking about Genesis chapter 2, where Adam is by himself and God says, it's not good for him to be alone, so I want to create these animals. So he'll have some companions. And God creates animals and then sends them along Adam's way, and Adam gets to name the animals. I think that's a fascinating thought when I was a kid, to consider Adam sitting there and saying, giraffe, zebra, elephant, tiger, you know, whatever it would be. Uh, bulldog. I think I got three of our main mascots for our church <laughs> in there. But Claypool said that's the way life can be for us too. These animals, which are in his sermon, struggles, times of hardship, sorrow, things that come to us. We didn't get a chance to create them. Maybe we, it's just nothing we'd want to create. They come our way and all we can do is respond to them. Adam didn't get a chance to do part of the color decorating of the animals. He didn't decide how many stripes the zebra would have or the tiger or whatever. He just had to take them in the form that they were. All he got to do was name them. And sometimes these things happen to us. These animals of hardship or hurt or pain or whatever, they come our way, they wander into our lives, and we don't want them to be there, but there they are. That's just where we are. 
And all we can do is respond to it. And we name them things like pain or, or terrible or horrible or end of the world or I just don't know what to do. Why? We name it all of this stuff to us. And it causes us to react in different ways. Sometimes when that happens to us, we become very bitter. We withdraw from all of the support and the friends and the activities that we have because we're trying to deal with something we wish had not wandered into our lives, but there it is. I read a story some time ago of two monks who were on their long journey back to their homes. And then they come to a really shallow river, but there's an old lady there who's really in despair. She says, I need to get to the other side, but it's a little too swift for me. I know it's shallow. I don't think I can ford the river and the bridge is out. So they said, well, no problem, man. We'll help you. And so they put their arms together and they sat the lady up there and they slowly made their way across to the other side and put her down there. And then they began to continue their journey. And as they go along, one of the monks says, you know, I hate these wet clothes. And if it hadn't have been for that old woman, I wouldn't be walking around here. These old wet clothes are just bothering me. A little later on, he says, my back is killing me. And I know it's because we lifted that old woman up and carried her across the river. If we hadn't had to do that for that old woman, I said, boy, my, it's my back's killing me. And he kept on complaining and finally sat down at one point and he said, why are you not saying anything to his other friend, the other monk? And he said, well, I'm not complaining because I set her down about five miles back and you're still carrying her around. And that's the way it happens for us. There was a lady once at a New Year's Eve party and she said to her husband, I know that guy over there, you've got a grudge against him and he did you wrong, but in the spirit of the season, go tell him Happy New Year. No, I won't do it. But he did. He finally did. His wife had her way and he went over and he said, Happy New Year, but only one. I only wish you one Happy New Year. <laughs> Sometimes we can't put it down, can we? It happens to us. It wandered into our lives. We didn't want it to be there. And it's where we are. We wish it was different. It's hurt. It's pain. It's horrible. It's terrible. It's whatever you've named it to be for your life. You didn't cause it. It's not fair. It's not right. And you can't go backwards and you can't run on ahead. It's just where you are right now. And you don't know how long it's going to last for you. And sometimes it's hard to put it down. But some people have found that if they can reach out to Jesus, that it gives them some hope and ability to endure whatever it is they got to face. Louis Grizzard called it this way. He said, this ain't no dress rehearsal. And you and I have been in those places before, and some of you are probably there too. You would never have cho chosen this load to carry because it's awfully heavy for you. So John, in the load he's carrying, in the place where he is, where he wishes he could not be, he reaches out to Jesus and asks the question, are you the one? It's a great model for you and me, by the way. And many people have found that if they reach out to Jesus, that this vision of Christ as company, a God who is with us no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, that this God helps them make it through to endure whatever it is they've got to face. We believe that this company we have is a Lord who has the ability to shine a little light in the darkest place and who sometimes can cause resurrection from things we thought could never have life again. And so he's in prison and he reaches out to Jesus. And it is very understandable to me that he has doubts and he is struggling and he's asking this question. And part of it is, he's grown up hearing about Jesus all his life. His mama had to tell him the story of when she was pregnant with little John the Baptist. And the mother of Jesus, Mary, comes up pregnant with the baby Jesus. And little baby John the Baptist was leaping in her womb. She had to tell him that story over and over again and how Elizabeth recognized that this woman, Mary, her cousin, was going to bear the Son of God. And he had to have heard his dad, who was a priest, who had gone in and had a vision of an angel telling him about the birth of his own miraculous son, John, and about who Jesus would be. When he got his voice back, Zechariah said this, "'Blessed is the Lord God Most High.'" 
He has raised up a mighty Savior among us. We will be saved from our enemies and all those who hate us. He grew up on this. And then in his own preaching out there in the wilderness by the Jordan River, he talks about a Savior who will come along wielding an axe that even now is at the root of all trees that bear no good fruit. And he talked about a Savior who has a winnowing fork in his hand at the threshing floor who will divide the chaff from the wheat. And the chaff, this Savior, will put into an unquenchable fire. Everything that is not of God will be burned and completely disappear. That's his preaching. And then here comes Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. And every great story of all the people of Jewish faith began this way. When the Messiah comes, when the Messiah comes, we'll kick all these Romans out of our promised land once for all. When the Messiah comes, justice will come rolling down like the waters. When the Messiah comes, our land will be free and we will dwell in peace in our own homes. And then Jesus came along, Jesus of Nazareth, and he wasn't at all what they expected him to be. There's another video that would be worth your time. It was something produced by the Washington Post, a reporter some years ago. He set up a hidden camera in a DC metro station and he asked the very famous violinist Joshua Bell to put on a baseball cap and play the same concert he'd played the night before at the Library of Congress. So he's down there in the metro station playing it with a hidden camera and throughout the you know, short time he's there, 1,092 people come passing by this very famous violin. He's, by the way, wielding a multi-million dollar Stradivarius violin. And he's playing the same concert. Seven people stopped to listen. One recognized him. He gathered in his little hat he had or his box there where people could put money, $32.97. The night before, you could get a ticket for over $100 for the same concert at the Library of Congress. It was very interesting what people expect to see in this world. John has some doubts, and I think it happens because he's in prison. He's in a place of pain, a place he didn't want to be. And maybe you're there too, and when you're there, it's hard to see things. It's hard to put them down. It's hard to see Jesus. John has some doubts about it. By the way... Remember, this is not John's story. This is Jesus' story. All four Gospels are telling Jesus' story. Luke has no doubts for us. In verse 19, early in the story, Luke says John is in prison and he asks about our Lord. And he sends messengers to our Lord. He is sure who he is. And then Jesus does something that is very frustrating and very wonderful and very common in his dealings with you and me. He doesn't say either yes or no to a yes or no question. <laughs> That's Jesus. It's awfully frustrating. It's very wonderful too. So are you the one, yes or no? And Jesus says to these two witnesses, just tell him what you see and what you hear. Frank St. Francis once said, you should preach the gospel at all times, sometimes using words. It's by his actions that Jesus is answering the question. In our church, we're talking a lot about sticky faith. It is a major initiative of our congregation. Our staff will go in March for some more training, our first real cohort training at Fuller Seminary. It is about essentially how we help spiritual formation occur in the lives of young people and how we do it as a congregation so that faith sticks a little better as they grow out and go into the world. It's a congregational thing. You'll hear a lot more about it. One of the things you may not be surprised about, but I do want to mention, is that young people tend to catch faith. They catch it. They hear about it, and they hear us talk about what we believe, but by far the most important way they catch faith is by watching you and me. You've heard the old thing. You've heard preachers say it before. You may be the only Jesus that someone will ever get to see. And people watch you and see if your words and your actions, but your actions speak very, very loud. I've always loved the old movie of Sergeant York. Y'all remember Sergeant York, the most decorated soldier in World War I? Gary Cooper played him in this old movie. I love old movies. 
And in the movie, Sergeant York, before he goes off, is a farmer. He's very poor, rocky top land. He can't plow it. He can't raise any crops. He always wanted bottom land. It just doesn't work out for him. He doesn't have anything for God, nothing for religion. But one stormy night, he finds himself wandering along a path by an old country church that's having a revival service. And something leads him. He's drawn into the church. And when he gets in there, the preacher sees him, and he has everybody stand up and start singing. And as he's coming, he's being drawn up to the altar somehow. He's been led up there. The whole church gets up behind him. Can you imagine coming in and joining the church that way? And everybody gets up and just for walks with him as he gets up there. And the preacher's leaning over from the pulpit. Take my hand, take my hand. And everybody's singing, give me that old time religion. And that's the way people still come to Jesus today. You may not think they do. But it's by looking at a whole church and they're looking at Jesus. And we're not pushed into it. We're just still drawn to Him. Right? Jesus has never pushed Himself on anybody. He draws people to Him. We've seen Him lifted high on a cross on Calvary and it has drawn people to Jesus through all these centuries. We see Him dealing with people one-on-one -on -one in their unique situations. There's not a blanket statement. It's one-on-one -on -one for them. We've seen His compassion lead Him to feed multitudes of people. We've seen Jesus stop in the road to care for people who are considered outcasts by others. Jesus doesn't just say yes. Boy, that would be boring, wouldn't it? He says, look at what you see and listen to what you hear. I'm doing. My mom, I told you a few weeks ago, I was some Sunday night and I said, you know, I don't want to go to church. Why do we got to go to church? I was a kid, didn't want to go. It was a sunny day. And mama said, what were those famous words? Why did I have to go to church? Because I said so, right? And I went to church. But I didn't tell you this part of it. She earned the right to say those words to me by her actions. This was my mama. And when I was sick, it was my mama who sat up with me. When I had asthma a lot as a child, my mom would turn on that humidifier and she'd come in and rub that Vic salve on my chest so I could breathe a little better. My mama fixed foods that I enjoyed to eat. On cold days, we live in a little trailer. We didn't have a lot. I had these old tough skin jeans with patches on them, and they were very cold in the morning. And she'd turn on the oven and put my jeans over the oven there a little bit to warm them up on the way to school. And, perhaps most significantly, as a child, she endured countless knock-knock jokes for me. <laughs> countless. Knock-knock. Who's there? Who? 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 Mama, you sound like an owl. I thought that was so funny. Knock, knock, who's there? Boo. Boo who? Mom, why are you so sad? Knock, knock, who's there? Banana. Knock, knock, who's there? Banana. Knock, knock, who's there? Banana. Knock, knock, who's there? Orange. Why? Orange who? Aren't you glad I didn't say banana again? Y'all have heard these. Knock, knock, who's there? Donut. Donut who? Donut ask. It's very important. We keep this very quiet and secret. There were countless of them. April Fools, every year, April 1 would roll around. Man, I would just trick Mama over and over and over again. She earned the right by her actions to say, because I said so. John's in prison, and he is in despair, and he reaches out to Jesus. And he needed a vision to sustain him, because his life was held by a thread from some tyrant and so he reaches out for a vision. You know what the early Christians basically did? They went around saying to each other, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> it's a very simple thing, but very profound. And what they were saying to each other is, there is no sin that you commit that our Lord cannot forgive. Jesus is Lord, and there's no mistake you've ever made that Jesus can't help you overcome and put behind you. Jesus is Lord, and though death come to your door resurrection will also come because Jesus is Lord. That'd be a good practice for you and me. Every morning, wake up and just say these words before you go out in your day as a reminder, Jesus is Lord. What a difference it could make. I've always loved the movie Ratatouille, where the rat's the cook in France at this little fancy restaurant. And Anton Ego, the critic, the food critic, comes and sits down to order. The waiter comes over and says very nervously, what will you order? What do you want today? And Anton Ego says, you know what I'm craving? A little perspective. <laughs> That's it. I'd like some fresh, 
clear, well-seasoned perspective. Jesus is Lord is a dish we need to serve each other and ourselves because what a perspective it is. I like to think that though John never got out of his prison, that when he reached out to Jesus and the witnesses came and reported to him, he was released. He was freed. He endured. Jesus later will say, there is no one born of a woman who is greater than John the Baptist. Of course, we have four Gospels. And there's another way to look at the story if you want to. If we just had Luke, which the Gentile Christians outside of Palestine, outside of Israel, this was their first Gospel that they read before they got the others. And if you just look at Luke, Jesus and John never meet. In fact, Jesus is baptized and John's in prison. So you could read it a little different way. Fred Craddock is one of the great preachers who points this out. You could read it this way. Instead of John saying, are you the one or should we just give up? Maybe he says, out of hopefulness, are you the one? Because I've been getting a lot of reports about you, Jesus. And they sound very positive. You might be the one. And I believe in the promises of God. And God has promised to send us a Messiah. And if you're the one, great. But if not, I'm going to keep believing. And I'm going to keep hoping. And I'm going to keep looking for the Messiah. Well, John just gets a report. What do you see? What do you hear? And then he's got to decide. Is Jesus the one or not? Just like you and I have to decide based on the reports of what we've seen, what we've heard. And I want to tell you, if you decide that Jesus is the one, one of the things you're saying is that the way Jesus did things and how he treated people and his expectations, well, those are God's ways. And that means we have to adjust to them. Our expectations, all of it. We have to adjust them because those are God's ways. Mary and I used to always love to go to the Atlanta Opera when we lived a little closer to Atlanta. And one of my favorites was Salome, the girl that danced at Herod's party for the head of John the Baptist. Salome by Richard Strauss. And it is a very haunting story. It is hard to listen to and hard to see. And in the end of the story, they come in with the head of John the Baptist cut off on a platter. And then Salome herself is struck down by one of the guards of Herod's uh, entourage there. One uh, observer puts it this way, There is no overture to ease you into it or gentle melodies to relieve the tension. It's an hour and a half of unbearably tense music with a text full of misunderstood prophecies. And there's only one set. They don't change the set throughout the whole opera. It's a big third floor where there's this perverse party of Herod the Great. And down in the dungeon is John the Baptist. And throughout it all, as they go all this stuff, through a metal grate, the voice of John the Baptist in operatic tones rises up. And on one part, near the end of the story, and near the end of his life, he sings these words. So the day is come, the day of the Lord. And I hear upon the mountains the feet of Him who shall be the Savior of the world. So what do you think? Was He asking the question out of despair? Or was He asking it out of hope? Either way, this is not John's story. It's the story of Jesus. And all four of our Gospel witnesses say this, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus says, Blessed are anyone who will not take offense at me. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church. And I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.